Okay, we're going to start back up here, guys. Um, I'm just going to take you through a quick spin uh, through one of the multi, like the web pages that we built to go along with Dan's story. Um, it's a templated page that just really draws the reader in, I think, visually to the story, so let you know that there's a big visual aspect along with the story um, that Dan writes. Um, and I think it highlights some of the issues that the Great Lakes are facing, like starting off with this photo, you can just see that's what's at the bottom of the lake. That's everywhere, that's not just one little rock. Um, and we'll just spin through. You see, start of the story, you get the visual of the first quagga mussels found. And you get coming down to a visual of the St. Lawrence Seaway. It just, it kind of breaks down the story as you go along, which is great. And I had an amazing experience building this. Um, we'll get to the Seaway history. And you can go right along with how the Seaway was built, some of the plans that came along with it, and then the invasive species that came along with it as well. So it, it draws you down the history, gives you visuals of where all of these invasive species are coming from, and it's thousands and thousands of miles away, and you just wonder how they got here. Um, giving a breakdown of what these invasive species do, and you have little player, almost baseball cards, of giving you the descriptions. Um, seeing what's next, and it's not only invasive species coming here, it's invasive species going to these international um, areas from our east coast. So, for example, this jellyfish is now found in the Black and Caspian Sea. Um, so it's kind of give and take both ways. And just more of how you see how it's just affecting everything, boaters especially, um, which is a big deal for us in the Midwest. You have a boat when you live on the lake, and it's a great time. But um, kind of roping into this, uh, the ballast water, we have a video that we'll play um, to show you kind of the ballast water and where this all begins and how it all gets here and why we need to fix this problem. When freight carrying ships travel the globe, they often carry invasive species along with their cargo. These organisms lurk in the ballast water freighters use to balance uneven cargo loads, or if a ship is empty, to keep it from bobbing like a cork on the high seas. Sailors used to rely on things like stones and sand, but modern boats use special tanks filled with water, and that water can be teeming with millions of organisms, from viruses and bacteria, to crustaceans, mollusks, even fish. This is a problem, because when a captain discharges his ballast water at a port in exchange for cargo, these stowaways get the chance to invade new waters. This has been particularly devastating for the Great Lakes since the 1959 completion of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which opened a nautical highway between the lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. Since then, freighters have brought in dozens of unwanted species, including quagga mussels, which now smother the bottom of Lake Michigan almost from shore to shore. Not long ago, a new species was being discovered in the Great Lakes about once every eight months. But since 2008, all ships sailing into the Great Lakes have been required to flush their ballast tanks mid-ocean to expel or kill any unwanted hitchhikers. No new invaders have been discovered since. Problem solved, right? Wrong. Just one ship can carry six million gallons of ballast in its tanks and millions upon millions of organisms can be lurking in those tanks. So a ship that removes 99% of these organisms with a ballast tank flush can still harbor thousands, maybe even millions, of accidental hitchhikers. And they can launch an invasion, one that could take years to discover. To bolster the protection provided by saltwater flushing, the federal government will soon require ships to install ballast treatment systems Regulators say there is no technology capable of reaching a 100% kill rate, and there may never be. But what if they looked at the problem differently? What if those ocean-going ships were simply blocked from sailing into the Great Lakes in the first place, at least until adequate ballast treatment systems are developed? 
The idea would be to have a boat sailing in from overseas transfer its cargo before it reaches the first lock on the St. Lawrence Seaway at Montreal. Or perhaps to a train. Is this even possible? Consider this. Last year, fewer than 400 overseas vessels visited the Great Lakes, carrying about 7 million tons of cargo. That's the equivalent of about one train per day traveling to and from the East Coast. To the shipping industry, the idea is radical. Great Lakes advocates argue it may be the cheapest, most effective way to ensure another nasty invader doesn't take hold in the lakes. And it would correct an earlier radical idea, the one that opened the isolated lakes to a world of trouble in the first place. Okay, I'll, I'll do that right now. Am I talking? Oh, I guess I'll yeah, you're not going to talk too loud. Is it okay? Okay. Um, you uh, have heard from Dan Egan already. Dan's been covering the Great Lakes uh, for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel since 2003. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for explanatory reporting in both uh, 2010 and 2013. He won an AAAS Cavalier Science Journalism Award in 2013 and the prestigious Oaks Award for Environmental Journalism from Columbia University in 2006. He's also received four National Headliner Awards for his environmental and science reporting. Joel Brammeyer is president and CEO of the Alliance for Great Lakes. He oversees a staff of 20 professionals and more than 11,000 volunteers dedicated to protecting and restoring clean water and building a sustainable future for the Great Lakes. He published a first-of-its-kind report describing options for the permanent separation of the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River. He also advises the state governors and provincial premiers on regional implementation of the Great Lakes Water Resources Compact. Joel received his master's degree from the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And Dr. Harvey Bootsma is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. He has expertise in most of the areas that we'll be talking about today, including large lake ecology, nutrient cycling, land lake interaction, algal ecology, aquatic food web dynamics, and ecosystem scale carbon dynamics. He received his bachelor's degree in marine biology from the University of Guelph and his PhD in limnology, the study of fresh waters from the University of Manitoba. And, um, Dan knows this, but a few other people in our newsroom do. I used to be a conservation and environmental writer myself before I uh, went into the editing world. And uh, many lives ago, I was a, a writer for Ducks Unlimited magazine and spent a lot of time in the Interlake region up in Manitoba and the Prairie Pothole region uh, up there. So um, that's our panel. And Aaron, are you ready? Or are we just going to keep going? OK, we're going to keep going. So as Dan was talking in the earlier session about his series, um, it really brought home to me what the O'Brien Fellowships are all about and what this investigative and explanatory journalism for public service is all about because we, we run into problems um, when we do things without really knowing the consequences, when we don't realize what we're doing. So the St. Lawrence Seaway, if you go back and read stories when they opened the St. Lawrence Seaway and built it in the 40s and 50s. Um, you'll hear all this crazy stuff about how the latest parish fashions are going to come by boat and be uh, paraded on the streets of Chicago thanks to this seaway. And that's how it was sold to the public, this giant subsidy for world shipping. Um, nobody knew that it was really going to bring us um, alewives and zebra mussels and quagga mussels and change the entire ecology of the Great Lakes and even cause the stench that we get on our beaches in the summertime now, which people tend to blame on MMSD or sewage discharges, but is actually related to the zebra mussels and quagga mussels and the algae and the rot, uh, not to sewage discharges. Um, by the same token, the city of Chicago was trying to solve an immediate problem with sewage uh, getting, getting the sewer, its sewage away from its drinking water supply when it connected the um, Great Lakes Basin with the Mississippi River Basin and blasted a, a canal 
to, to ship its sewage downstream to St. Louis and Point South. Um, and the, we were so ignorant as human beings at that time that when St. Louis sued Chicago for sending its sewage um, down to, to, to its drinking water supply, <laughs> the Supreme Court rejected the argument because the water looked cleaner and, 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 and this stuff about microscopic organisms didn't make any sense. They didn't know what that meant. So uh, it just shows you how far we've come in such a short time in knowledge. And in, in a democracy, that's how we solve problems, by learning uh, about those consequences and figuring out how to solve the problems. And that's what these journalism projects are all about. So uh, we're still in the early stages, I think, in this um, case, because I'm not sure um, how much the public really knows about the problem. And that's what I wanted to start with. Um, Harvey, if, if you look out um, and enjoy the sunrise on Lake Michigan uh, this morning on a beautiful fall morning, it looks just as beautiful as it did 30, 40 years ago. But it's not if you look below the surface. And you've probably spent more time below the surface than just about anybody. So tell us what you see when you go diving. Um, as far as some of the major changes go, uh, if you compare now to, say, 30 years ago, um, there's a few obvious changes. One is uh, yellow perch, which is near and dear to the hearts of many people. It used to be the staple of the Friday night fish fry here in Milwaukee. Um, we see very few yellow perch anymore. Um, there used to be plenty of them in the lake. There was a commercial fishery for them and a uh, sport fishery for them, and now we rarely see them. Uh, there's still some there, but really not enough to support any significant fishery or the Friday night fish fry. Um, instead of yellow perch now, we see the round goby, which Dan referred to er earlier, which is an invasive species. Um, and there's a few other species which, if you're into fish biology, you would know some other species that we used to see in the near shore zone, not as abundant as yellow perch, but things like um, uh, spotted dace and, and uh, mottled sculpin. We don't see those anymore either. All we see now is goby. So there's just one fish you see now, it's goby. Um, not only is it the only fish, but it's an extremely abundant fish. Um, so in some ways, you actually see more fish in the near shore now than you used to, but it's all one fish, it's the round goby. So that's one big difference we see when you go diving. Uh, the other big difference is obviously the mussels on the rocks, and Aaron showed a video earlier. You really don't see a lot of rock there now because the rock is completely covered with mussels. So that's a huge difference. Um, and then along with those mussels is the uh, algae. Uh, and we actually have pictures of um, the bottom of Lake Michigan, about 30 feet deep, from the 1970s and from recently. And these pictures really show the difference. What you see in, in the 70s is kind of bare rocks on the bottom, no algae on them, no mussels on them. Um, but there's one other difference you see as well. And that's in the 70s. You kind of see the rocks, but they're a little bit hazy. In the 1990s and 2000s, you see the rocks with the mussels and the algae growing on them, but the water is also a lot clearer, which to some people is a good thing. Uh, generally, we think that clear water is, is something that we like, um, but that actually has created a number of problems for Lake Michigan. So that's something that you really see now when you dive, is that uh, the water clarity is two to three times greater than it was in the past. So as a diver, those are the, the major changes you see. If you're a recreational diver, um, the other thing you're interested in is shipwrecks. Divers like diving on shipwrecks a lot. Now almost every shipwreck is completely covered with quag mussels. So it's, it's really changed that as well. And Dan, you, um, when you wrote your series, you talked about what the early explorers and, and the, the Great Lakes of Father Marquette uh, <coughs> were like, um, a, a true ecosystem that had been separated from the rest of the world for a long, long time um, and had all that variety of species in it. And now, as Harvey put it, there's one fish, a whole bunch of mussels. That's a terribly out of balance system. Yeah, and, um, and uh, it's coming back into balance over on Lake Huron, which is in some ways, the same lake as Lake Michigan. The two lobes, they're very different water bodies, right? But um, gobies are now becoming a favored food for native species like walleye and lake trout and yellow perch 
even though they're not making it out to adulthood. But uh, the gobies, it's interesting. Ale wives were like a cockroach in the 1950s and 60s, and then they became the salmon food, so they became very valuable, as valuable as the salmon, arguably. The same thing may happen with gobies. Once, once native fish start to eat on them, they are now the link between those mussels and, and predator fish, which is the sign of a healthier ecosystem. And you've said um, that really the mussel is such an um, incredibly powerful organism because it, it rewires the energy of an entire ecosystem. And Joel, you're, you're seeing that the Great Lakes problems are becoming North America's problems as the mussels um, come th came through the St. Lawrence Seaway, now are escaping through both recreational boats and the um, Mississippi River system, uh, which is also connected to the Great Lakes artificially, and um, just wreaking havoc to ecosystems across the continent now. Yeah, if you look at, uh, and, and you haven't seen this today, but if you, they're easy to find online, if you look at maps of how the, the Dreisina, the, these mussels um, species have actually spread across the United States, it's, it's so painfully, abundantly, bluntly obvious that the Chicago Waterway has delivered these mussels to the western part of the United States over the last 20 years. And you can see the spread of these species across the U.S. as a result of this connection between the, the, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. So it's this attention that's been drawn to it in the Great Lakes region and, and, the, and the way that the states have rallied around quite aggressively finding a solution to the Asian carp problem um, has been playing out going the other way for two decades before this. Uh, it's just that um, we didn't hear as much noise about it from the, from the western U.S. Uh, and, and that connection between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River has really caused uh, a great deal of damage uh, in both directions um, already. It seems like uh, Dan mentioned the Cuyahoga River fire being the impetus behind the Clean Water Act, which really accomplished some great things in the 70s and 80s. We're going backwards in a lot of ways now. Um, but um, it, it seems like the public uh, needed something very dramatic to happen to really get an understanding of how bad things were. Is that what we're seeing now with um, the Asian carp problem versus the mollusks, which are harder for people to understand? Is it the problem we're seeing with the Toledo water problem? And are, do you think that um, the, the knowledge is spreading enough to start uh, seeing some real action? Should I take that one first? Yeah, well, you start? <laughs> well, I, the answer has to be yes, right? Um, because that's what I do. Like there, there, I mean, the, but, but there, the, the answer is yes. It just takes a lot longer than anybody would like it to. So if you look at the, at the Chicago Waterway, um, this thing that was blasted out of, out of rock 120 years ago, um, it looks, it's an anachronism. The, the, it is completely at odds with the way we think about water management in the 21st century in the United States. There's a huge movement. Uh, across the country right now in, in, in dozens, hundreds of municipalities, the idea that when water comes out of the sky, you put it to use where it lands. You don't capture billions of gallons of it and then try to move it somewhere else. Right? This is just kind of, this is just good planning, we call it today. This is not like a new idea. The Chicago Waterway is, a, is, is, is anathema to that. It, it, is, it is the exact opposite of that way of thinking. And so it's, the whole city is built up around this idea that you need to capture billions of gallons of water and then send it hundreds of miles away in order for the city to be prosperous. And so you've got to effectively blow up that way of thinking. And you have to come up with a new way of thinking about infrastructure and then get people who run the city and run the county and run northeastern Illinois to accept that, okay, we can make this shift. We can, we can catch up to the rest of the country in the way we think about managing water. And that's happening slowly, but it's not happening, uh, and it's happening slower than the carp are moving. Um, and so the challenge is to move up that process and to get people to think a different way about how we move water around. Because the reality is, you probably read this in the paper, uh, if, you cl if you put a physical barrier in those waterways tomorrow, Chicago would flood. Like, that's true. That's absolutely true. Um, and so you can't do that the way the system exists right now. We have to f actually fundamentally change how we manage water in order to solve this problem. And there's, um, it isn't like there isn't precedent for this. And as Dan described, um, with the St. Lawrence Seaway, there's, there's a very narrow passageway that everything has to come through if it's going to get through to begin with. The seaway itself is too small for 
the boats used uh, for most sea shipping today. Um, in Chicago, you've also got uh, a uh, um, uh, narrow passageway where everything's escaping from. Um, people have known how to ship cargo from big boats to smaller boats and from the ocean to inland waters uh, forever. And it seems like that this is an, uh, something that could be fixed with engineering at a very reasonable price compared to the damage that's being caused now that we realize the damage is being caused. Would, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, how, what's the first thing you'd do to start uh, and ending the harm to the Great Lakes first before we start fixing what's already there? What do you think, Harvey? Um, well, well, as Dan pointed out earlier, I think part of the problem is momentum or the inverse of that inertia in that um, we have systems in place now and a lot was done to put those systems in place, whether it's the Chicago Sanitary and Shipping Canal or the St. Lawrence system, which was you know, lauded as this great um, engineering wonder when it was first built. And so we just have a natural tendency to um, or a natural reluctance to back away from those things. Um, and, and you can see this all over the world. Our, our solution to problems used to always be the engineering solution. Um, and you see that everywhere. If you look at, uh, well, we can see it here in Milwaukee now where we're now going back and taking out all of the channelized um, water um, conveyance systems that we put in place 50 years ago. At the time, we thought it was good to control flooding. Now we're realizing that it's not always a good thing to do. It damages ecosystems. On a larger scale, the th same thing has happened in the Everglades, where they did the same thing. They tried to drain all of southern Florida and realized eventually what damage that did to the Everglades. And so now they're kind of taking all of that out and going back to a, a more natural system. Um, but there's hesitation to do that because a lot of time and effort and money is put into investments like this, and so I think we're naturally reluctant to, to say, yeah, we did it wrong, we need to back up and, and change something. Um, so I think that's one of, the, one of the things that impedes progress on this. I think there are, getting back to a point you made earlier, you do need kind of um, poster childs to help stuff like this along, and, and that's on both sides. There's a reason the Worldwide Fund for Nature has the panda bear as its icon. It's a lot more cuddly than a little beetle or something like that you now. Um, and it's the same on this side. It's hard to convince people or get people really concerned about zebra mussels and quagga mussels if they, they don't see them and they don't get underwater and see what they're doing. Um, but it's getting more attention now that you have carp flying out of the water and hitting people while they're fishing. That's something that people can associate with both people in the Illinois River and people in the Great Lakes region who are worried when they're going out salmon fishing or trout fishing on their favorite trout stream that they're going to have carp flying out of the water there. So icons like that um, do bring this um, to the attention of the public. And I think that's really one big hurdle that um, has to be overcome and that can help this whole process along is educating the public and making the public aware of these issues. Um, Dan said earlier that, I think he said something like, I'm, Harvey's a scientist and I'm just a journalist. I would turn that around and I would say, I'm, just, I'm a, just a scientist and Dan's the journalist. And that I think it's really important to get this, this information out to the public and get support for tough decisions that need to be made at the political level. Um, things like, you know, Closing the, the St. Lawrence Seaway would be a huge decision and it would be a very political decision. And it's not going to happen unless there is quite a bit of public support for something like that. But Dan, uh, when you've looked at how much commerce actually comes through that seaway, it's incredibly small compared to the cost. Yeah, and every, the, it's a number that frightens the seaway people um, as well. Uh, I remember talking to the previous Seaway administrator and asking him what he thought about the report, and he said that he didn't read it because it wasn't really science. And I mean, this is—it wasn't complicated, and and, and it was it was peer-reviewed, and they found out that that $55 million was actually maybe a generous estimate. But one of the things that is really hard, I think, is the whole notion of prevention because if you do it well, nobody really knows the value. 
we were warned about zebra mussels. If we would have taken appropriate action back in the 1970s and either restricted the ships or did something with their ballast, the only thing people would remember about that decision today is how we blew up a perfectly good industry for some obscure little thing. We, we don't know what we're doing until, we don't know what we're protecting until we've lost it. And it's kind of hard to, it's just a reality. And um, the same thing's going on with the carp. And, and we can't even predict what's gonna happen, where, even if we know a species is gonna come. I'll just say real quickly, what's going on in Lake Erie is so scary, but it's driven also by these mussels because they eat pretty much everything in the water column but this toxic algae and they spit that back out. I mean, there's studies showing them. They'll take everything out and they just, they don't have brains, but they're smart enough not to eat that. And, and, and that's selecting for that toxic, poisonous algae. So now when you have an algae outbreak, it's the nasty kind where 30 or 40 years ago, it was a bunch of different types of algae. Nobody could have, when they first started thinking about mussels, ever made those, connected those dots, ever in a million years. So you don't know what's coming next. When the Army Corps, was looking at expanding the seaway back in 2001 or 2002, one of the first things they said is, yeah, it's caused a lot of damage, but it looks like we've seen the worst of it. Kind of like that apocryphal story about the um, patent office closing in the turn of the century because we've invented everything. Um, you know, we can't even conceive what more we could need. And, um, and we have to keep that in mind. We don't know what's coming next and we don't know how existing things are gonna interact. And that's why it's really important to um, to recognize that this isn't just a one species issue, it's, it's really a, a Great Lakes issue. Can I just comment on that, the last point you made about um, the, the, you know, the worst of it's over. That's a very dangerous attitude and you, and you actually see it sometimes in, um, in agency staff and bureaucrats who have, been, who have been working in these issues for a long time. This, this mindset that we're dealing with a flawed system and it's so, it's so bad, it's gotten so bad and there's been so many catastrophic events that have happened that it's just going to be managed for the rest of our lives and we're, you know we're going to stock fish and we're going to send people out on charter boats and we're going to hope for the best every year and that attitude um, can really curtail making progress toward the kind of potential for a restored ecosystem and, 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 and if that grabs a hold of the public's uh, the public's notion of what the Great Lakes is uh, it can it can really um, add to that inertia that you were talking about Dan well, and that, uh, that brings up another point um, of the phosphorus in Western Lake Erie problem because, um, as Dan mentioned earlier, um, the Clean Water Act largely came about because of Lake Erie. Um, and it was amazing, all of us who lived through the 70s and 80s, to see the changes that happened with these waters during that time period. Um, waters that uh, basically, if they had any fish in them at all, they were carp actually sucking air off the surface because there wasn't enough in the water and these terribly polluted rivers all over the country. Um, coming back to life and becoming walleye fisheries and trout fisheries and, and, and supporting life. So we cleaned up the phosphorus problem to a large extent once already. And it's amazing to me to see it coming back uh, with a vengeance because of the like Dan said, the mussels um, eating everything except the toxic algae that the phosphorus is producing. Um, so uh, why, why don't we talk a little bit about that problem and how, again, you have um, an, a, a, an industry um, that's really a, a small number of people benefiting um, from the lack of regulation on the phosphorus, but it's affecting everybody, even a city of 500,000 water supply. So, so I was not alive, during, well, I might have been alive. I was not around for the political debates that surrounded the, the creation of the Clean Water Act uh, and, and certainly the first years of its implementation, but I'm a student of history, so I've, I've read a lot about it. And one thing that is clear to me about what, what happened back then, if you look at the, the, the two, um, there's two kinds of, of, of places that were really causing a lot of the problems. Uh, that, that the Clean Water Act helped to fix. One of them were cities, cities that have sewage plants, sewage plants that dump things into the water. Uh, and the other were factories, and this could have been paper mills, it could have been steel mills, chemical manufacturing. And 
we successfully dealt with a lot of those problems. And not to say that there aren't still problems outstanding from those kinds of pollution sources, but we dealt with a lot of those under the Clean Water Act. And I, and I think that um, we can stand back and talk about what a great approach the Clean Water Act is and how it works and we should apply it to farmers. But there's a, there's a big difference here, and that is that the economy of the Great Lakes has changed dramatically since the early 70s. And um, if, you, if you look at sewage treatment plants, for example, sewage treatment plants have a natural constituency, right? It's the people creating the sewage. You create this, I mean, we don't, most people don't think about it this way, but you create some sewage and then you pay somebody to take care of it for you. You're paying through your property taxes or whatever, however your, your community collects money to do that. They build a plant, they take care of it, clean it up, send it back out in the, into the environment, that's great. Um, if you're a factory and you're producing goods and you've got lots of jobs that are anchoring that factory locally or you're using a lot of that pro the steel that's being produced or the paper that's being produced or whatever it is in the Great Lakes region, you've got an economy that's close and you might not have the same thing as a rate payer paying to clean up sewage, but you've got people who are invested in that economy locally who understand the importance of cleaning up that mess. Now fast forward to today and we've got a system where the pollution, the, the main sources of, these pollu of, of this pollution, particularly in the Lake Erie situation that's causing the problem, is coming from an unregulated source, primarily agriculture. And um, agriculture doesn't employ a lot of people locally. Uh, it does contribute a lot to the state's bottom line, but a lot of the goods that are created by that, by that industry are actually being exported to other countries um, from, from the Great Lakes. Um, there's no natural constituency that is demanding, well, we've got to clean up this water because my job depends on it or because um, my, my city depends on it. There's no ag uh, aggregation of voices that, that's actually making that economic demand for that source of pollution. Um, and that's a, real, that's a real problem. We're highly dependent right now on voluntary solutions and on federal incentives, federal payments basically, to solve a problem um, that really ought to be built into the market that this, that this industry exists in. And this is not to vilify any sort of any one polluter, it's just to say our policies uh, and our approaches to paying for solving the problem haven't really caught up to where the Great Lakes is in the, in the global economy. Yeah, and I think that's a great point is how, how, how we're not, um, and I guess this is a process we use to deal with change, but things of, the economy has changed, uh, the way of farming has changed. Uh, and, that, and, and we have to adjust our regulations if we want to protect our waters in the same way. Um, Dan uh, wrote about Green Bay and how um, when the Clean Water Act was passed, um, most of the farms in Green Bay were small family farms with 50 cows in pastures, uh, plopping in their pastures, and that's where it stayed for the most part. Now, uh, some of these uh, dairy farms have 8,000 cows that never see the light of day. They're in warehouse uh, factory farms and they produce in just Brown County alone about the same amount of sewage as a city the size of Houston, Texas and none of it's treated. Why don't you talk about that a little bit, Dan? Well, the, it's interesting because I think one of the fundamental principles of pollution control is the first thing you need to do is get your hands on it, concentrate it put it in one place where you can deal with it. And these guys are unknowingly taking care of that first step. It's if you're going to have 100,000 cows in a watershed, it's a lot better to have them concentrated from, from a certain perspective yeah. um, uh, in, on these factory farms because there it is in a lagoon. Now you got your hands on it and there are some tools you could treat it. Um, and it's going to cost money. And, and I, I appreciate what Joel's saying. The complicating thing is it could be a lot more expensive for a gallon of milk to come out of the Fox River watershed than to come out of pick a county in Iowa or even in Wisconsin. How do you, how do you set the structure up so these, these guys don't go out of business? How do you spread that cost, that extra cost for a gallon of milk equitably? And um, that's, that's what's got to happen. And I, I don't know how you get there, but I know that there's a way to do it. It can't be that hard. I think that's very fair, and, 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 and we're, looking at a, we're looking at a time in the, Midwest, in the upper Midwest, I, I mean, I know the Great Lakes region the best, but I know a little bit about the upper Mississippi, of a, a, lot, of, a, a lot of economic pressure on agriculture to increase production, whether it's gallons of milk or whether it's bushels of corn. And, um, and that's just a, that's a, that's a, a, a force of reality that we're dealing with. And so the question is, is probably not, how do you put people out of business so we can stop pollution? Because you know, taking people's livelihood away doesn't really solve problems. 
Um, but having an honest conversation about, well, if we're going to say our goal is, you know, X million gallons of, of milk, you know, per county per year, or if it's 250 bushels of corn an acre by 2050, which is an industry target um, uh, for, one of the, for one of the growers associations. If we're going to say that, then we also have to say, uh, can we do that without creating toxic water in Lake Erie? And, and then you've got to have this straight conversation about how to make that happen and who's going to pay for it um, and, and how we're going to distribute those costs, like Dan said, absolutely. And we have done that once before. The Clean Water Act didn't do it with agriculture, but it did it with cities, municipalities, and factories. Um, and uh, did apply a cost that we all shared as a society to, uh, you know, it used to be that cities and towns would just dump their sewage directly into rivers. Um, we don't do that anymore. And um, uh, it's interesting that uh, I hadn't thought of that before, Dan, that the first step might have been concentrating the cows so we <laughs> treat their sewage too. Uh, why don't we open it up for questions now from the audience? Um, and uh, Herb's going to bring the microphone around. Hal? Lake Huron, Lake Huron, I'm not going to say it right, but people mispronounce Oregon. Oregon. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, in that self-sustaining system, the salmon aren't self-sustaining, right? In, That's in still system? a hatchery system, right? In which system? Lake Huron. No. Uh, well, there's basically no, very few salmon left, but by the end, the the... the vast majority, I think the numbers were, they were putting three and a half million hatchery fingerlings into the system and the system was naturally producing 18 million fish. They didn't know that at the time and they basically redlined the system to the point that they destroyed the prey base and that prey base isn't coming back because... So, I mean, one economic argument would be if you could get to a natural system, it could hope to be self-sustaining in a way that the salmon fishery never could and maybe in a financial, I don't know what the And that's, ex that's exactly what is happening on Lake Huron. They're, they're getting to the point they've stopped stocking walleye because they're just going great guns and uh, they're looking at stopping stocking of lake trout which is the native top of the food chain. When you say a natural system, you know, it's never going to go back to what it was but if you think of it as a more self-sustaining system that's got a greater assembly of assemblage of, of native species, that's, that's happened. And it's really a fascinating thing to look at compared to Lake Michigan. When I lived in Alaska, that is a self-sustaining system. They have put in a few hatcheries and the salmon runs, though. The wild in the Northwest, you know, the, the, the natural, native salmon runs are still the subject of a multi-billion dollar restoration effort. And then on top of that, we got the same thing. Everybody wants to catch a salmon. Well, you can't catch these. They're endangered. But here, we'll just create a huge hatchery system. We'll clip their fins so you know what they look like. And we'll spend millions of billions of dollars that way to subsidize a, a, a salmon fishery. But it has to be every year you have to trap some of the salmon, get the eggs, and plant them. So it's not at all self-sustaining. So I guess in a way, we're, we're trapped in that, too. Um, so yeah, that, that was my thought. One other question is, how about on the milk thing? Um, if you could get the idea that this is a, a, a chronic problem, maybe it's most acute in the, um, in the dairy country, but that cows are creating pollution problems across the country, somehow if there was a user fee that was uniformly attached to milk, across the country, nobody would be at a competitive disadvantage. It might bump up the price of milk just a little bit, and then you would um, take all that money and, you know, in your, here it would be used for the, the treatment of, the, of, those, of that concentrated manure, and then I'm sure that other regions would have other uses for it. Yeah, and I think Joel would speak to this better than I, but the price of a gallon of milk isn't really a market-driven thing anyway. It's so... <laughs> Manipulated, <laughs> and th yeah. And th this is why it gets daunting when we t when we get into this because um, we we do have a system set up of federal payments for for activities that that might help with water quality on the ground. Maybe they don't. That's in the farm bill. Uh, 
they're not really designed to, to, to pay for water quality. And then we also have the system of price supports. I mean, the, the, the price of milk, as Dan was saying, is a constructed thing. It's not as though it exists in a free market by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, if you look in the agricultural supply and distribution chain, whatever you're thinking of, whether it's milk or corn or, or whatever product, I think we need to start asking where in that chain can we build in the idea of water quality sustainability? I mean, that's a highly relevant sustainability topic for the Great Lakes. Right, it's, and it, and it is, it's a, it is part of the, it, well, it is part of the production, but it is not currently a cost that, that, that exists anywhere in that, in that chain. And so, Unless you define a cost as being water that you right, can't Right, 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 and we can't quantify that. So um, and it, the, the point here is that, is that um, we, we're either going to be relying on the, federal, on, on the federal government to provide payments under a system that wasn't designed to, to make water quality happen, or we've got to figure out a new way to actually get um, that as part of the production process. And um, one thing you said too, uh, Hal, that I'd just like to bring up and see if, if, if it's worth further discussion too is, even it, when Dan talks about like here on um, finding some sort of uh, semblance of balance after the crash of the salmon population with some native species doing better, I think it, it seems to be a sign of hope, but as long as those doors are still open, uh, we don't know when the next giant sh earthquake is going to occur and knock it completely out of balance again. Because just in, in my lifetime, um, we've seen uh, the lake trout be decimated, uh, alewives take over. I remember when I was a kid reading that alewives were once 98% of the biomass in the Great Lakes. I mean, just think of that. Now zebra mussels and quagga mussels are probably 98% of the biomass in the Great Lakes. And it shows you how incredibly out of balance the whole system is and how you just flip in a matter of a decade as long as uh, things are still coming in from all over the world. I don't know uh, can I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You're going to respond go ahead, go ahead, to that? I just had a question on you talked a lot about having no unified constituency um, that you're up against. Are there any individual economic influences that are power, powerful enough that could, are, is there anything else out there that's competing that would have any influence when you think about the way things change in our world? If, mm -hmm. You know, lawsuits that cost a lot of money for industry. That's part one of my question. And my second part is how powerful in terms of dollars is this industry? What, when you look at lobbying efforts and things of that nature with politicians, how much money are they giving that would, that would be that influence? What would you be competing with? I'm not sure about the competition part, but and I don't know how much money they're spending lobbying, but I don't think they have to spend a lot because they've tapped something that is just is essential in this region, and that's this idea that we are uh, global ports and we're connected to the world. And they hold, they the shipping community, I think, really holds undue sway over not just politicians, but over our psyche, and and it's only through education that 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 can change. As far as something to counterbalance those economic interests of the shipping industry, it's, I think, grassroots organizations. It's, it's information that Harvey gets out, and it's, it's, the, it's the message that the, that the NGOs, the environmental organizations, and the media spread. I would, I would say that the shipping industry and the agricultural industry operate very or occupy very different economic um, niches. So the, the shipping industry that uses the St. Lawrence Seaway is, it's sort of like, if, if, this, is that, if this is that, and then, the, then in, outside of that, you've got the entire industry of lake shipping that's this big. And then outside of that, you've got all of the actual commodity movements that are happening in the Great Lakes region. It, I mean, it is, it is a very, very small portion with, with influence over the operation of the seaway that's really undue given its, uh, given its economic impact. And, and the same is true for the small number of, of transits that are using the Chicago waterway moving into Lake Michigan and back and forth. The agricultural industry is an incredibly important part of the Midwest, you know, three-legged Midwest economic stool, right? And so, you know, uh, Governor Kasich of Ohio I uh, made a statement that I, I was checked last week on PolitiFact about how uh, Ohio or, or agriculture is the most important um, uh, industry to Ohio, something like that. In fact, it is. It is the highest 
the highest uh, single industry percentage of, of economic impact annually in Ohio is the agricultural industry. So they're, they're in very different places in terms of their role in being able to influence, or their, their appropriate role in influencing public policy. But there also have been public policies that have been beneficial to both uh, farmers and the general public and the environment many times in the past through the Ag Bill and the Conservation Reserve Program is an example of that, that was allowed to pretty much expire and with recent farm bills where um, millions of acres of land were taken out of production, uh, put into uh, grasses and natural uh, cover, which would also help prevent soil erosion and phosphorus runoff and other things. So do you, see, do you think there's ways to use uh, these types of levers we've had in the past uh, to encourage, we in the past they've been used to encourage, uh, to discourage soil erosion and protect the soil to prevent that runoff from going into Lake Erie? Well, so, so but there, there are some changes to the Farm Bill recently that make that possible. However, there's a big difference between um, controlling soil erosion and controlling uh, water pollution. Soil erosion keeps a good on your land that you need right there on your property that you can see. Water pollution primarily affects something in the case of Lake Erie that might be several hundred miles away. Um, and so if you're a farmer, um, the water impacts that, you're, that, that you might be part of aren't actually felt until they're a couple hundred miles downstream in Lake Erie. And that's a very different, um, there's a very different mindset to dealing with those problems. I think it's important to distinguish between also the individual farmer and agriculture as an industry, right? And so, so um, this isn't about uh, sort of suggesting that any one person is responsible for a problem. It is about looking at an overall industry and saying where within this industry is the right way to pay for the cost of doing business. Um, and I, think, I think that's an important distinction. So I had a question about sort of the certainty of science about this. I'm looking at Harvey. Um, both uh, to think about uh, solutions for the future. Is it, I mean, what's the predictable certainty that you can um, share and um, you know educate the public with if we did X then Y would result and also I, I'm, I mean Dan has referenced this on a couple of occasions that you just don't know what's going to happen when the next bad thing happens but you know how, how much can we look forward and backward and say we could have predicted this therefore we could predict a, right. a solution right um, yeah whenever journalists call us up they're asking us to predict the future <laughs> and, uh, um, scientists will never do that um, but I think, and they'll ask that in a few, few regards. You know, some people will ask, what do you think Lake Michigan will look like 20 years from now? And my answer to that is, if you had asked me in the 1980s, what will Lake Michigan look like 20 years from now? Or if you'd asked any scientist that, nobody would have given you the right answer. Nobody would have predicted that Lake Michigan would be today what it is today. Um, and that's just the unpredictability of invasive species how they can completely throw a system out of whack in a way that's just very difficult to predict. But I think um, with regard to management actions, there are things that we can, we can predict. So for example, you know, if we look at the phosphorus problem, um, we can say what will happen to Lake Erie if you reduce phosphorus to a certain level. And it's actually that kind of science that has driven in the past things like the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. It was science that determined what should be the phosphorus loading targets for each of the Great Lakes. And that was set into the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And it worked. Um, we achieved those goals and actually achieved a lot of success in the 80s and 90s. The problem right now is, so you can't manage a system until you understand it. And that's where the science comes in. You need the science to advise the management. And so the science is figuring out how the system works and once you know how the system works you can say how it will, re will respond to various management actions whether that's fish stocking or phosphorus loading. The problem we have right now is that we still don't know how the, the lakes work because they've changed so much in the last 15 years that we're still trying to figure out how these new lakes work. For example if we look at the phosphorus story um, Based on the way Lake Michigan used to work, uh, if you or the way Lake Erie used to work, if you loaded into the, those lakes the amount of phosphorus that we are today, you shouldn't have any problems in those lakes. And yet, if we look on Bradford Beach in the middle of the summer, 
we have piles of algae washing up on the shore on, on Bradford Beach. That's because the lake is operating on different rules today than it was 15 to 20 years ago. So getting back to your question of um, predictability, right now we're really working hard to try to understand the way that the new lakes work so that we can come up with that predictability. The Wisconsin DNR is coming to us and saying, um, should we tell the sewage treatment plants to decrease their phosphorus concentrations by half in their effluent? If we did that, um, what would the ramifications be for Lake Michigan? They want to know because it's going to cost millions of dollars to do something like that, and you want to know that there's going to be a benefit for that cost. And so we are trying to work towards answering those questions, but it's very challenging now because we still, the, the systems are in a state of transition. They aren't at what we call steady state, where you, they're much more predictable if everything is kind of working constantly. But for example, quagga mussels still haven't reached their maximum biomass in Lake Michigan. In the offshore waters, they're still increasing in numbers. And we see in every other part of the system that things are still in flux, still, still changing. So that makes it very difficult for us to say, how does the system work right now? Which in turn makes it difficult for us to tell managers, this is how the system is going to respond if you do this or do that. If you, and if you, what's interesting is if you went to Milwaukee, around Milwaukee today, um, and this is all anecdotal, but I think if you ask people what's causing that horrible smell at Bradford Beach when the wind's blowing a certain way, they're still going to blame it on the sewage treatment plant. I mean, at least a lot of people will. And it's really, you know, Harvey was talking about that super clear water, which is, and, and, and the phosphorus fueling this algae, which then dies, rots, and causes this horrible stench. So, um, you know, it just shows you how, how out of balance things are. But as we learn more, hopefully we can, we can deal with it. I have another um, ecology question for you. Um, so I'm pretty baffled by the fact that so many of the invasives in the lake are actually marine oceanic organisms. And I'm wondering if we knew that these organisms could even survive in fresh water. Um, and what that kind of has meant for their adaptations and their, I don't know, yeah, physiology and whatnot. Right. Um, yeah, we do have some marine organisms. A lot of marine organisms wouldn't be able to survive here. They can't survive the change in salinity. But some can. So the alewife is the classic example. It's a marine fish. But it's tolerant enough uh, of salinity changes that it can live in fresh water. Um, but one of the reasons we often see huge alewife die-offs in June is because this isn't their natural environment and they are stressed and then come June when they're reproducing and then they hit rapid temperature changes, they get pushed over the edge and so they die. Um, but for most, most of the year they can exist in the lake. Sea lamprey is another one, uh, just like the alewife wife that came up the St. Lawrence Seaway and uh, it can put up with uh, the freshwater conditions that we have. Um, but like I said, a lot of other organisms can do that. But that's, that's one concern when you look at um, ways to solve problems like the ballast water problem. Right now the solution to that is dump your freshwater ballast in the ocean and pick up saltwater ballast before you come into the Great Lakes. The idea being that if you have freshwater organisms in there, the, fr the saltwater will kill them. And it will kill a lot of them, but it won't kill all of them. And so there is still a possibility that um, salt tolerant or, or um, organisms that can tolerate a huge range of salinity uh, would not be killed by that, uh, which is why um, agencies are looking at more stringent measures to try to um, kill organisms in ballast water. Just a quick comment and then two quick questions, please. One is that uh, about two months ago, Marquette and the Zilber uh, Foundation sponsored a program on uh, heroin and opiate drug addiction where teenagers and these teeners, teenagers have been dying by the dozens, literally. And what struck me about that program was 
Everybody and his brother and sister was there. The police were there, the politicians were there, the social service agencies were there, the health department was there, because it was finally in somebody's backyard. I'm talking about constituency. And so all these other counties that stereotypically you wouldn't think would be involved, they had meetings at their city hall or schools and they expected 100, 150, and they get 300, 400 people coming in because suddenly it affected them because there were parents of their kids, now these drugs are in the suburbs, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it struck me as a constituency that interesting things can happen. In this case, Narcon, the anti-antagonist, was given to ER people so they could save people's lives, literally, by having this drug available, which wasn't previously the case. Anyway, my two quick questions are, um, does this same phenomenon in some way analogously happen in the canals of Europe or Suez Canal or um, Panama Canal? And then the second question is, you talked about the DNR, which I would see as a more invested agency, but does academia and uh, non-specific government agencies, is there a lot of collaboration and cooperation, or are they two different worlds? I assume the question was for me. <laughs> well, you, you talked about, the, didn't you talk about the DNR? Yes. Or, yeah, okay. yes. But I'm just wondering, first of all, about the, the different canals across the world, not exactly right. the same thing. And then secondly, is there a collaboration, like with the freshwater studies, or is that two different worlds? Right. Um, I'm not as familiar with uh, marine systems, but certainly there's been a lot of invasions and movement in marine systems as well. Uh, and I can't speak specifically to the Panama or Suez. Um, but there, there's great examples of marine organisms moving around. Um, the lionfish is a great example right now, where it's, it's kind of invading all over the Caribbean and causing a lot of problems there. Um, so there's certainly examples like that, and, and some of them are, are fairly dr dramatic on scale, similar to what we see with the, the zebra and quagga mussels here. And this whole phenomenon of globalization of species is something that scientists and managers are trying to tackle now. Um, some scientists have gotten to the point where they've kind of thrown up their hands and they, they've said, this is going to happen anyways. And we have to stop being so alarmist about this, but we have to, um, in some ways, take advantage of these new systems and study them, and we can learn from that. Um, and they actually published a paper like that in, in Science several years ago. The scientists who published that were, of course, chastised by a lot of other scientists who said, no, this is, this is still a terrible thing that we have to try to stop. So, but because you know, globalization and transportation is just becoming so easy now, I think some scientists and managers are saying, let's stop um, throwing our arms up and um, complaining every time this happens because it's kind of inevitable which is a little bit fatalistic, but um, you can see why they're thinking that way. Um, getting to your second question about collaboration between uh, management agencies like the DNR um, and even federal agencies like the EPA, I can say within the Great Lakes that um, there certainly is quite a bit of collaboration among those agencies and other organizations like universities that uh, do research. And there are a number of different consortiums um, that allow these groups to come together. For example, we have the Lake Michigan Fisheries Forum uh, here in Wisconsin, and that's usually um, fishermen and management agencies and university people coming together, often with very different perspectives, um, but they are coming together to discuss some of these issues. Um, and then Lake Michigan also as a whole has representatives from the three states around the lake who meet regularly to decide on things like fish stocking numbers and so forth. Um, a lot of this collaboration is done through, through mechanisms such as um, funding opportunities. So agencies like the DNR or the EPA will see a certain need um, and then they will put out funding for universities or other agencies to address that need to do research on it and then come back with, to them with the scientific data and the results. So um, in general, that collaboration is reasonably good in the, in the Great Lakes area. And I think it should be noted that though isn't the DNR fisheries biologist's uh, his office is at the UWM. That's right, in the same building. In the that same we building, are, which, and and the EPA um, docks its Great Lakes uh, research vessel at our school, which also facilitates um, collaboration. 
When uh, <clears throat> jurisdictional boundaries were set up in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, based on straight lines uh, to uh, facilitate land sales, uh, there was not a boundary waters treaty which now uh, divides states. Uh, so which is the priority? Uh, water quality is delineated significantly by the Boundary Waters Treaty or these old states that don't necessarily uh, focus their uh, attentions politically on water quality. Uh, did you Not, say don't, don't focus their attentions on quantity or quality, did you say? Well, and quality, ahead, quantity yeah. as well, if you look at the diversion. Okay. I'm not totally clear on the question, but it just makes me think about what maps would look like if we drew our political boundaries along watershed lines. It would make, it would solve a lot of problems, and it would probably make for a pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think bio, bio regionalism is is one construct that has been proposed for uh, moving towards a watershed based uh, jurisdictions. And Joel, you you do some of that work working with the governors and the premiers. Yeah, I, I do, and I think that um, you know the, the the example that Dan cited in his comments earlier about the Great Lakes Compact, this idea that we can't divert water away from the Great Lakes except in very limited circumstances. It was a rallying point for the governors, for the states to come together and say, well, here's something that we can all be against, right? And that that's a great way to get people energized, right? There's because there's no losers uh, within the Great Lakes Basin, um, and and that actually turned out to be a very productive process. Uh, Getting rid of state boundaries, I'm not sure about that, but but you're but you are hitting on something that that is real that is really important, and that is that um, we do have to uh, move beyond the idea of water quantity. That, that this idea, I think the states have done a very good job of saying, of of recognizing that if the water is not here, then the Great Lakes don't have value. That's a fairly intuitive statement, right? And so we want to keep that water here. If the water is here and the water is toxic, and the New York Times headlines say thick slime on Lake Erie stops people from being able to drink their water, are we really getting at the core of what we need to be getting at? Um, and, and, and the answer is no, we're not. So we're going to need to get over that hump and figure out how we can generate water quality as a consequence of the Great Lakes economy. Um, I think we can actually do that with, with some of the structures that we have. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Um, but. Uh, but uh, I think you're right that the states are going to need to be uh, in a leadership role if that's, if that's ever going to happen. You remind me of something that Harvey said earlier, too, when he was talking about how some scientists are kind of throwing up their hands and saying, eh, this is going to happen anyway. That reminded me of how a lot of Chicago's reaction has been to, to all this. And, and that's part of the politi political problem if we're going to come up with solutions is uh, Chicago being Chicago. You know, the first thing they thought of with Asian carp is, Oh, how do they taste? Can we sell them? <laughs> um, we got to deal with that. Um, the uh, I'd like to give our panelists uh, one chance uh, to uh, talk to the room and to people who care about the Great Lakes but who don't know as much as you do in, in the detail you do. What, what kind of idea, what would you like to leave them with if you could leave them with one idea of how they could help? Well, I had one thought when Harvey's talking about the scientists who throw up their hands and, you know, it's tempting and in a certain level it makes a lot of sense. But um, I remember uh, Anthony Ricciardi, I don't know if you know him, but he's a very passionate scientist from um, uh, McGill in, in Montreal. And his, his response to that is, look, we're all going to die. We know it, right? That doesn't mean we don't try to stay healthy for, for as long as we can while we're here. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a good re response to that kind of fatalism. It's literally fatalism. Joel? This is a globally unique place, and we have a privilege uh, to be able to take advantage of it. Um, we're facing complex problems that are far different from what we experienced in the 60s and early 70s. The government is not going to solve those problems. Federal money is not going to solve those problems. Um, people like the people in this room can actually get together and push for the solutions that, it's, that are going to be required to solve those problems. And that's the only way that any of this is going to get done. Um, so uh, take heart, don't despair, uh, and recognize that we've got a wonderful work in progress right outside our door. Harvey? 
I'm going to try to squeak two things out. <laughs> um, the first is just uh, building on what Joel said. I think it's easy to, um, we have some real issues that we have to deal with. And um, obviously they receive a lot of the attention right now. But I think if you look at the history of the Great Lakes over the last hundred years, we do have a lot of management success stories as well. Um, we look at things like sea lamprey, which we still have, but they're not nearly the problem that they were back in the um, middle part of the century where they just decimated our, our um, fish stocks. We look at some of the contaminants like PCBs. Um, you didn't want to touch a lake trout in the 1970s. Now you can eat lake trout from Lake Michigan. So I think it's important to realize that not all is gloom and doom, and we do have um, some success stories that um, have played out with the Great Lakes. Um, and the other point I guess I'd like to leave everyone with, uh, it's not so much a solution, it's just an observation that I think I mentioned to Dan when we were talking about this when you were writing your articles. It's the concept uh, of what ecologists call, call shifting baselines. And that's just how um, our systems change, and yet every new generation accepts the system that they're born with. And so most of us are really out of touch now with what the Great Lakes used to be and what they could be, because we tend to accept uh, what we observe and what we see. I grew up close to Lake Erie, and uh, we still have home movies of me swimming in the nearshore waters of Lake Erie with dead fish floating around me and algae floating around me. It didn't bother me, because to me that was Lake Erie. And uh, so I was astounded when I came back to Lake Erie in my early 30s and saw this really clear lake. Um, and I was really impressed because to me that wasn't Lake Erie. So that was a good thing, but my concern is that we lose, we lose that image of what the Great Lakes used to be like and, and what they could be. And I think if we can instill that in the public through education, which includes journalism, I think that carries a lot of force to promote um, conservation and some of the, the management activities that we need to put in place. And that is how we solve problems in this country. Uh, public education, sharing that knowledge. Please go out and share what you've learned and read the series and, and watch the videos. They're fantastic. The kids did a great job too. Marquette and the Frechettes are doing fantastic work by, by expanding this knowledge. And uh, I thought they were great questions. So I'd like to thank all of you for your great questions today too. But let's thank our panel here.